Rafael, thank you for the introduction. Geraldine as well, and Roberto for organizing this event. And thank you for everyone else for finding the time to be here. Um, I should say I'm very flattered to come right before the party, so, so that's exciting. <laughs> I'll try to make it short and uh, interesting. Um, I've decided to speak of a series or a number of themes that at present time are um, topics of discussion inside the office, things that are of, of profound interest to us. And I must say that, that it's, I don't see this as a closed list of subjects. I see it more as an open notebook of ideas. So. Um, the other thing is uh, I'm going to show seven projects and I'll try to interweave these ideas and how these ideas inform our work as I go along and show uh, different projects that are in process. Most of them are, have been designed like in the last two years, uh, except for one, which is social housing, and I'm glad I, in, I introduced that in the presentation because of, of the other uh, speakers before me. So I think that that will add to their discussions and, and hopefully it will enrich this uh, discussion on social issues and, and social housing, to be more specifically. So these different ideas, what's interesting to me, these different topics, is that over time I have found that they uh, become uh, tools, or, or at least I, I strongly feel that they have the potential to become uh, tools that define our everyday process of taking decisions. Um, and the other thing I find interesting with them, is, like I said, that I just chose a number of them with no particular order, but that uh, over time you find that there are strong connections between them. Um, so this is, like I said, this is by no means a recipe to, to what we do. And, and uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and mention them shortly, and then I'm going to start with the projects, and, and I'm going to start to be more explicit about these ideas. So the first is this idea of how systems can inform or enrich our practice. Uh, this is a long time obsession in the office. Uh, I'll show two or three projects that are directly related to this idea of how to make architecture through systematical thinking. The other one is this personal need that we have inside the office to revisit history. Uh, I find this particularly interesting in, 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 in our generation. I, I, I can address my generation as a sapping generation. Uh, first time I heard of this concept is, is through John Sorn, the, the New York musician. Uh, but that I think very well describes the kind of context that we've grown up in. Uh, this idea that we can jump from a completely, from one world to a completely different world with, you know, just by sapping uh, some control, either in our computer or television, or just by how the world has been shortened in distance in every, in every way. Um, another point is, and, and I think this one's particularly interesting in terms of how it relates to the previous lecture, is the idea of being local and how that has affected our work and where we stand in that position or in, in terms of that concept. Another one is clarity. This to, once to me is a especially tricky one. Um, years ago I was visiting La Tourette and came across uh, one of Le Corbusier notebooks that they show there. And there was this phrase, and I'm going to say it in my own words, I tried to Google it after that and I haven't found it, so if anybody knows the source for this, I'd be, I'd be happy to know it and then look it up and know exactly what it said. But uh, words more, words less, it said, uh, la, in, la integridad entre las partes es la creadora de emoción. Integrity between parts is that which creates emotion in architecture. And that image really stuck in my mind. Like I said, this was years ago, but it's something that I've reinterpreted and uh, kind of made my own uh, tool in terms of judging the work we're doing and trying to make sure that we're nailing what we're supposed to nail. And finally, which is a bit different, is this uh, interest inside our office to involve ourselves more and more into social projects. Uh, 
I will show a pro bono project, which is a recent project inside the office, which has been, um, I, I think it'd be fair to say, within this inside, within inside the office, it's been like a major turning point of how we see our work and the things that we're interested in doing into the future. So I start with this image. It's the office. Um, there's a bunch of the people that still work there. Uh, I've had the fortune of working with really talented group of people uh, from many, many different countries. And the other point here to me is that as I go along showing the different projects, I will credit the people that I've worked with, uh, not inside the office, but or inside the office as well as specific collaborators that I have invited to work with on these different um, projects. I, I was very happy and, and excited to see how many collaborators Jose and Saidi had on their projects. And then Rafael mentioning that there's this collaborative spirit within Mexican architecture today. Uh, so this is really something that I was not aware of or that I really didn't plan for but that uh, putting up this presentation and before this, just looking at, at, at the work when, when you kind of make like a synthesis of it, I find that, I don't know the exact percentage, but maybe 70% of the projects inside the office uh, have been done with another office or I have invited somebody else to interact with them. And my interest in that is, let me, you use this image to, to try to, to, to explain this. I'm a big jazz fan, and, and, and clearly in jazz, uh, that's a major factor. Regardless of what you're playing, even if you're playing the same uh, standard or song or piece of music, uh, every time that somebody in that lineup changes, uh, the outcome is different. So I do believe that the individuals involved in doing this architecture really define in one way or another or refresh the work that we're doing. So the first project is a project that we did maybe a year, year and a half ago. And for this, I invited this close friend of mine who's Eric Mas, who's an architect that I studied with and has been living in Spain for the last 10, 12 years. And this was special for us in many different ways, starting with the site, which is I'll show you the pictures in a moment, but which is quite special. So this is a peninsula of, of, of Yucatan, and in the most northern point, point of that peninsula, we came across this client who had 13 kilometers of a front, of a beachfront, uh, protected behind through this Rio Lagartos Parque or Reserva, and um, this. I mean, this is one of those places that as an architect you visit and you hope that nothing is ever built there. And fortunately, the restrictions, because of the reserve being there, were incredibly uh, strict. Uh, the density is by far the, the lowest that I've ever encountered. Let me see if I get it right, but I think for every, for every hectare, you can build 200 20 square meters, which is really ridiculous. So that was the good news in terms of uh, envisioning the future of this area and, and knowing that at least it would not be crowded into crappy architecture, but that the architecture that was done there would be very low density. So this is pictures I took on the first visit. Like I said, it has the beach and behind that it has this uh, reserve made of manglers. And this is our lot right here. And I should say before I explain a little bit farther that the project uh, had to do with, in the mind of our client, to doing a small investment that could be able to detonate further development in this area and that could set the standards for the type of development that he was ambitioning. So he really wasn't sure of what he wanted to do, which is, but on the other side, he was really open-minded. Uh, so, so that in many ways is a fantastic client because he was willing to, to talk about these things and to come up with a solution together with us. So after many conversations with him, I came across um, Googling, I came across one of these fancy hotels, and I can't remember the name, 
but that had a fantastic slogan that really captured my imagination. It said, luxury Robinson Crusoe experience. And so this to me nailed our problem because I should have mentioned that the downside to this place is that obviously Yucatan is gorgeous, like you saw in those pictures, but there's so many other places that are as beautiful as this and that are closer either to Yucatan City or that are more accessible or that have more services. This has no services whatsoever, this area, meaning it has no light and it has no sewage, etc. So there was, and, and like I said, the very low density. So this became a very tough equation in terms of finding out uh, what we could do there that could turn all those seemingly uh, downsides into something that could play in our favor. So with that idea, we really uh, all got excited with this idea that you could really charge a lot of money for people to go and experience this place while giving them a very um, primitive, in quotes, um, experience in terms of not being the conventional air conditioned and, and high uh, comfort experience that you would usually look for. So we, this is something that we do all the time, and, and this can probably bring up one of the themes that I wanted to talk to you about, and it's locality. And why are we interested in locality? It's, it's really nothing of, of a fashion manner. It's because after doing it several times, we have discovered that it really, um, that it really allows us to find a field of opportunities of something that can really define and, or become something that defines our project and gives it a sense. So, and farther than that, I would say that it also really tells you how to apply architecture, in this case, for example, to really extreme uh, climates. So in this case, these images were very seductive to us because if something is really fantastic about this architecture, it's how fresh it is. In that, in that zone or in that um, uh, climate. So we looked at how these works, how these uh, uh, thin or permeable walls worked as much as how these tall uh, volumes work where heat is always going to the top and is liberated somehow at the end. So this was a very moving idea that we tried to interpret it, interpret directly. And there's another really fantastic quality about the site, and that is that it's facing north. The sea is facing to the north. And usually this is not the case, so you usually have the dilemma that where you want to open yourself, it's where the sun is going to heat you and it's going to heat the house. So taking this advantage to, to our side, we we're speaking more and more about the idea that the house should simply be like an umbrella. The, the site was so fantastic and we thought it really needed very little uh, architecture from our side. But so this idea of just a simple uh, umbrella then turned into this bioclimatical diagram that really represents exactly what I showed you with the vernacular images. And from there, this image of the umbrella really turns into this three-sided box uh, that's giving its back to the south and protects you from the sun. And is then we fit the program into different boxes, uh, allowing the wind to flow in between them. Again, a bioclimatical uh, diagram. I should say that this is probably our most where we have had the, the opportunity to take sustainability to, to like its more extreme expression inside the office. And like I showed in the first image that was so fantastic for us, the Robinson Crusoe house, there's no trees in that area. So the first thing we had to do is like build our own forest or tree of columns, and then within it, fit these different boxes create this roof that will allow the sun, I mean, will, will allow uh, to shade the different boxes inside, and then these protecting walls. The, the second thing I think is relevant to this project that was deeply in our mind is this systematical thinking. We, we first of all saw this as a pure grid, a bidimensional grid, and then we were really excited to discover the different possibilities of how 
to interpret this grid in a three-dimensional way. And the trick here was, like I said, the dimensions, the density dimensions were really, really low. So when we started doing the first drawings, the 200 square meters seemed criminal because uh, the house, all the program we needed to fit inside this, this house uh, was very close to that same square uh, meters. So we had no chance to further uh, create sunscreens or to create other area just to protect the house from the, the, the really extreme sun. So the trick here, and after negotiating with, with the people inside the authorities, was that uh, they do not consider this as a formal roof. It's made out of carrizo, I would say it's something like bamboo. It's not exactly the same thing. And so if that was not considered, this is what's creating our big umbrella. And then those smaller boxes do have a formal or permanent roof. But so then you, have your, you can cover yourself from the sun and create this experience of being under an umbrella while having the different uh, habitats. Uh, why is it so extreme in a way, or why would it seem so impractical? I think I should have mentioned that before. But clearly, uh, to us, after uh, talking with the clients many times, we figured that the house needed to be, uh, the words we used was a tool to experiment the size, to the site, site. Or the house should be an experience in itself. So it's by no means, this is a house that once it's built, is the, the intention is that it will be loan to people and that that way he can take people to the place and talk to him about developing uh, this area. And so it is by no means intended to be like a single family house where they will go either live there permanently or go there for weekends. It is more focused to people spending two or three days here and having an extreme or, or a fantastic experience with this beautiful site. So again, the walls with the same material that I showed you on the, on the first vernacular image and how these walls protect the house from. And again, this um, system, or just very simple grid system, and I might make a, a, a parenthesis here to tell you about why, why, why are we so obsessed with systems? And, and, and to put it quite simply, I think that the reason is that um, to us, it's a way to set some very clear rules to what we're doing and that those rules prove to be quite wise. Those, those rules prove to have a really powerful uh, reason of being behind them. So it is this fascination of really finding a system that will then allow you to solve all the intricacies and all the different layers uh, that involve doing architecture. But once you've set that system, really trusting that the system will show you how to do it or if you're sensible enough and you listen to these rules, uh, that they will make sense and it will become a coherent object. Just some renderings of what it might look like. And again, the whole, I'm back to the lot and how we envision this as being an experience to, to get to know uh, the site. So it's not only about the house, but about a bunch of things that we designed within that lot that were, that did not uh, matter for the density, but that would become, like I said before, tools to experience the site. Um, one thing that was very interesting in working with this project definitely was the client. Uh, he, I mean, he's somebody that I consider to be extremely smart and open. And one thing he was very clear about was that the project had to, uh, let me put it this way, they had to be in a fair trade manner in terms of where it was being built. Because the town that I showed you right next to Rio Lagartos, the, the Reserva, is obviously a fishery town and is having a tough life uh, time surviving. So he was very um, aware or conscious that first of all, what we built there needed to be built with hand labor from that site and that to start with, but that also had to be inclusive in terms of, uh, of the way it was built and we found that building with the 
typology and tradition of construction that was already there was the right way to do it. So after that, the fishermen in that area asked us to design like a small shelter that they could build for really no money um, and that they could set in the front of, like in the front, be in the beachfront, uh, and that they could spend maybe the night there to go fishing early in the morning. So all it is is it's, it's a bedroom with a small kitchen and a bathroom. Uh, so this in a way is like social housing but for a different purpose and using what we had learned with the previous project we came up with this. So again it's empty below because of rising tides like the house I showed you before and then it's using the same construction systems. Um, again, speaking, this project allows me to speak about our interest in systems. Uh, the other thing that really, really interests me about that is how you can turn the universal into the concrete, or um, I'm hesitating to use the word local here, but how you can use uh, something as universal as a system to solve a very specific problem. So in this case, we were asked by the governor of Puebla to design one of his kickoff projects for his administration was to uh, take care of the Atoyac uh, River. So uh, with, the with an office called Taller de Operaciones Ambientales, who, which, that I've collaborated in many projects, and I'll tell you as I go along. But um, they, they asked us that Taller de Operaciones Ambientales was working on this project in terms of, of, of cleaning up the place and making it public. And they needed like a kickoff to have an information box, something of a very small uh, but iconic uh, building that could allow uh, the government to tell people what they were trying to do there and that could symbolically set the project forward. So, like Jose mentioned before, in Mexico it's the, the just standard for people to call you and tell you, I need a really fantastic project, I have very little money and I need it in two weeks. So over time we've learned to recycle ideas as well, like to use our previous uh, lessons and then move them forward and that really helps in, in finding good solutions in, in a short period of time. So uh, I'm showing this project right after the other one because we directly took from the lessons we learned in the house that we did maybe two or three months before. And in visiting the site, this is what we found. Uh, a bunch of waste and interestingly enough, most of that waste were these bottles. So we were absolutely sure that if this were going to become an iconic information box for cleaning up the, the river in, in the Puebla, that we needed to use those bottles as our container walls. So again, the grid, in this case, we came up with this idea of what we wanted to do, which was an interweaving of nature and built space. And then just very simply, uh, like I said before, it, it needed to be built extremely fast. So we found like a standard um, steel um, perfil or column that we could use over and over. And then with this structure, we started carving, I should say. So the space is very small. It's only an information area with a big model and a lot of terraces where people can sit and look at the river and be informed of what's been going on. And this is what, the, what it looks like after the process of design. So again, it's these very simple standard columns that you would find anywhere in Mexico. And the intention for this is to be covered with uh, plastic bottles. Uh, the other thing that I might mention with this project that I, that I, I mentioned in, in, in the list when I started talking, was this kind of obsession with history. And um, within history, for example, one thing that, that is coming over and over in, in, in our office is uh, this profound interest for porticos. How do you say that, Rafael, for? See? OK, so there you go. <laughs> and so this is coming from that. Uh, and, and I'm not showing previous projects where we had explored this uh, spatial idea.
but this was coming both from the um, systematic idea of working with the grid and finding different ways and, and finding uh, different options that we could find within that uh, seemingly rigid uh, system, and also with this idea of revisiting el portico, this historical portico that works incredibly well in, in, in most of the climates in Mexico. This is a project of social housing. This is Gerardo Asali. This is a close friend of mine from school who had had experience working in big social housing projects. He'd been working with um, some of these big developers. So he was an insight guy. He knew uh, all the tricks. So that's why I invited him. I thought it was really fantastic um, to have someone with his experience informing our project. And the site is Oaxaca. And I start with this image because uh, for those of you who have been there, Oaxaca has an incredibly strong identity. It's one of these, it's probably one of the most visited sites in Mexico. And the reason is that its architecture has really conserved itself over time. And while it's this very simple architecture, it's still very powerful and very profound, at least in my mind. So all it is, is this um, mostly masonry buildings with two to one uh, windows and then the appliance of color. So when we were asked to do this project of social housing, again, we were very fortunate to find a really interesting, in this case, a very progressive thinking client uh, that had bought this land. Uh, I shall say that this is maybe a 15 minute drive from the center of Oaxaca, but it's still in the periphery. And I was not, um, this is something that was very clear in my mind, that it's not the ideal, and I agree with the, the earlier presentations in terms of that dilemma. Uh, but still, we, 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 we were pretty sure that we could uh, bring an interesting input to this problem without solving it completely because of its nature. So these are the three lots that my client invited us to work on. And the project was divided in two phases. This, which is a smaller lot, which is three hectares, uh, and these two, which are 11 hectares altogether. This is a project of 98 houses, and all these together are a project of 1,000 houses. So this density is much lower. And why is that? Because the client, when he bought this lot, it was already fragmented into smaller lots, so there really wasn't much we could do in terms of urban design. But these two were a different case where we could design everything from the streets, the layouts, the public areas, the green areas, and so on. So for the first one, all we could do was design a house. Um, and this is a very tight equation when doing social housing because every single decision counts. So like they mentioned in the previous presentations, uh, social housing in Mexico has been done generically. It's been done by the hundreds of thousands. Um, and if you look at the different standardized models that these gigantic corporations are doing, they're almost identical, regardless of where they are, regardless of what they're trying to solve regardless of where they are in their urban planning, not only where they are in terms of what city they're being built in. Uh, and they, for the same reason, they always have the same problem. And if, if you look at those floor grounds carefully, usually what kills them and what makes them impossible is that they're so small and then the circulation inside just fragments everything and makes it very rigid. So for this project, and going back to the image I showed first, and going back to our interest in locality, um, I had spent maybe six months, 10 years before living there. So I knew Oaxaca very well, and I had the fortune of living in a typical house. And what happens in, in such a great climate as Oaxaca is that to go from one room to another, there's no need to go inside an interior circulation. But that also solved the problem that when you have so little money to invest and everything has to be a, a very careful decision, uh, usually, and, and not, not even usually, but when I go back to the site plan, you'll see that there's another developer doing thousands of houses in that same area and with the typical floor plan. So he has no money left for this outside 
uh, terrace or outside covered uh, space, which is absolutely vital in a climate like Oaxaca. So to us, it was very natural to try this, to try to mimic the traditional house in Oaxaca. And the client uh, was really sensitive to this idea and bought into it immediately. So all this, this house does is that the circulation is outside, then I'm protecting myself from the sun, like you would see in a typical house. And then it has this uh, growth plan where you can uh, keep on adding square meters and you have different options of where the patios will be left over. Two of these houses were built like prototypes. The rest, the plan is that they will be start building them in January. Um, and the houses were incredibly successful with the people approaching with the final clients. And that, that brings me to one thing, to, to, to another really interesting thing to us. When, when, our, when addressing this first social housing project, one of the big questions that Jose and Saidi mentioned is this idea of what things should be. So if you talk to a developer, he's convinced that people buy these houses with the images that Jose showed that are just heartbreaking because that's what people want. And that, I find that incredibly offensive. I find it almost as, as if somebody told you that people are stupid. And so I won't bite into that argument. So we made a big discussion about this in the office and we said, okay, what are these developers saying be in between lines? I mean, what, what, even if we don't believe that people will not buy something different if you offer some, them something much more interesting, where is this model coming from? And, and it's quite, I think, quite um, easy to know. Uh, the suburban houses that are being done by the hundreds of thousands in the outskirts of, of, of urban sprawls in Mexico are uh, inspired in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and early 70s uh, American dream of the suburbs. And they actually strangely look like them, although I don't think it's very clear for anybody where that started. Uh, but you don't have any of the advantages that you had at some point in the suburb, even if you're being very critical about that model. But at least you had gardens, uh, at least you could walk in the streets, so your kids had a different life. But none of that is, is, is true with social housing in Mexico because the gardens are taken by the cars and just the, the, the way they're planned uh, has nothing to do with the open and the possibility of living or the advantages of leaving out, living outside the city instead of in an urban dense area. So, like I said, these are only the two first houses. And here I might say that we felt incredibly comfortable just mimicking what was already there. So we were certain that the uh, houses had to have color. And this was our way to responding to this first uh, issue of if we do something different, what kind of reaction can we expect from the public or final client in this case? So uh, building or doing this project in such a place as Oaxaca, it was immediately clear to us that there was a great value to the historic center of Oaxaca, the image I first showed, which has this very simple architecture. So that was something that we could directly draw from, or that we could directly um, go and try to reproduce in this new house model and that people would immediately identify. And that, that proved to be right. People, uh, this uh, prototypes have been built, I think, for at least a year, a year and a half. Um, the, we haven't started yet because of just bureaucracy and because it's incredibly hard to get these things done. But um, people immediately went to visit the houses, and there's a list of, at least for this compound, where all the houses are sold, or at least there's a paper uh, for every single one where somebody has made a compromise to buy them. And the reason is that they identify with them, and also that they're reasonably well-planned, meaning that they are very fresh. We, run these, we ran these houses through biotech several times to, to learn how they would behave bioclimatically. And that is something that, 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 that really works and that is usually a crime with these social housing units that they don't take that into consideration by any means. 
Okay, now these are the two second phase, 11 hectares. And in this case, we were very enthusiastic because we could design the urban uh, layout. And we were certain that this should not be a simple house. Why? Because when you're, you're designing a thousand uh, different units, you're designing a small part of a city. Uh, and a city is a living identity, there's no doubt about that. So a city behaves like a system, even if it's not planned. Why? Because it must be flexible. Why? Because it must allow for the interference of the people that inhabit it, their changes in interest and just how time naturally um, changes things and constructions and the way we live. So in this case, system was a word that was at the top of our list of things we had to nail. And this works very much like a Lego system that has, in this case, five very simple pieces that then if we play along with them, I'll show a video, uh, we come up with multiple um, possibilities of how we can treat, treat the space. So they're very simple. It's like dining room. Um, I really can't see, but it's din dining room, living room, kitchen. That's just where you start. That is 35 square meters. And then as you go along, you can keep on adding stuff and you come up to about 75 square meters. And this is option A, B, C, D, and so on. This is an approach of how they start to interweave between them. And we were really fascinated by the idea of this multiple tapestries that you could uh, achieve with, with this very simple five models to start with. Anyway, what this video shows is this was a video that we did with only three of the pieces because we immediately found out that otherwise it would be too complex. But it's just uh, really, to us, really exciting how you can interplay with these and just create multiple forms. And the reason for this is that um, you need all these options in order to be really smart about doing such a small unit because they're going to be facing different orientations. Some of them are going to become uh, commercial areas. Some of them will grow naturally because two families will want to fuse them and so on. So the, the number of, of, of needs that need to be addressed uh, for housing in this context are, are so large that we felt very strongly that the only way to solve this was through a system that allowed us to explore these multiple options. So I'm going to go on. Let me see if it's not working. There we go. And there you get a sense of the differences that we could create with this thing, five models. Um, okay, this is a project, Ruta del Peregrino, that Rafael mentioned. This is a project where collaboration was at the center of our minds. Um, Tatiana Bilbao invited me to work on this uh, with the Secretary of Tourism of Jalisco. And again, a very open mind client. He's a, a big art collector in Mexico. Aurelio Lopez Rocha, who knew he wanted to, first of all, make a master plan for the Ruta. This is La Ruta del Peregrino, a phenomenon that's been going on for centuries in Jalisco, um, around the Virgen de Talpa, but had had very or none whatsoever investment on the part of the government. So people just went there year after year. And, but there, was, there really wasn't any infrastructure to try to take advantage of this phenomenon in terms of trying to bring money to the different communities along the pilgrimage. So we, first of all, knew that we were going to work in a master plan in terms of where to, I'll show you in a moment, where, where to place the different things. But there was also a different uh, layer, maybe more architectonical and less of urban planning to the project that was that um, they were sure they wanted to bring a new narrative to the project, like to revitalize the narrative and experience of the project, and also hoping to break the temporality of this phenomenon, meaning that um, there could be a good reason for people to visit this really gorgeous landscape areas 
in another um, moment of the year that was not specifically for the pilgrims. So this again, this is something that we found all over the site, same problem. Same problem of having just improvised infrastructure. And this phenomenon of what in Spanish or in Mexican, because it's a very specific phenomenon that takes place here, uh, what's called the milagros. This is uh, images that people hang along the way to make promises or to give sense to their pilgrimage. So these are the, just very briefly, these are the plans that we develop for the master plan. I, I can't read the, but they're either meant for medical aid, water resources, resting areas, uh, and so on. So that was a big part of the project. It had to do a lot with uh, being involved with the different municipalities and finding the different options of how we could make this work. This is by Taller de Operaciones Ambientales. Again, it was a really fantastic idea because they found these three like protected or protected to a certain degree like manchas or sprawls that then we decided or they, they proposed that the ruta become this corridor that tied, that tied all three areas together. Uh, then for the more iconic, uh, trying to reinterpret it or revitalize, I should say revitalize and not reinterpret, uh, the narrative of the ruta, uh, Tatiana and I thought of inviting and curating a group of international architects to each do a piece within the ruta. The program for these pieces is either lookout points or sanctuaries, ermitas, uh, chapels. Um, do we use different names for them? But uh, basically, there are these points that kind of mark, become landmarks within the pilgrimage and become like central to people's voyage. So that's us visiting the site. And this is like the master plan for that layer where we start here with a piece done by, no, I'm sorry, we start here with a piece done by Tatiana and me, and then as we go along, the different architects involved, and Tatiana did two pieces as well as myself, so I worked on the first one and the final one with another friend, Roxana Montiel, Periferic. So this is the first one. I'm gonna show more briefly the two pieces where I was involved, and then the rest I will show very quickly. But what was special about this site is the only site that is next to an urban, or at least to a built environment. And it's right in the intersection where people start their, their trip, this religious trip. So people are coming in this direction, in that direction, they've either parked there or they've gone there in buses, and they start their walk right here. So this had an important symbolic, um, there was something symbolic there that we really needed to, to answer to. And once I've mentioned symbolic, this was our way of something that we were very aware of that we needed to be very careful uh, with this idea of our client of bringing contemporary architecture to this context, that that was pretty risky. And one of the ways we tried to solve this, at least in our case, was we decided to work with a very symbolically charged approach. Uh, that was one thing. The other thing for this specific case is that we knew that this is a structure that needed to be seen from far away because it needed to some way signal the beginning of this pilgrimage and it needed to create shade. But going back to the symbolic um, feature of it, we just suddenly said there's nothing more symbolic in this case than the cross. And from there came our interest, which is quite obvious, but obvious in many ways, in, in, in many occasions, is, is quite fascinating to me, but um, the cross for centuries has been the same layout for any church. And so for this open chapel, this is another image, I'm sorry, but this is another thing that we, Tatiana and I really had in our minds and that really fascinated us was, this is um, called La Capilla Inconclusa, somewhere in Portugal, as well as this uh, convent or church in Oaxaca that was never finished. So this fascination of ruins, which Louis Kahn talks about, which your mind kind of has to set the mode to try to 
uh, complete the idea of what's going on with those spaces was very attractive to us. So we did this open chapel following, um, maybe, there we go. And then I'm going to go back, but that's what it looks like on the floor plan. So it's basically an abstraction of what a church would look like that then becomes this sculpture that you can see from the distance and also has this quality of creating shade uh, for the first like stop of the pilgrims. And as we've seen, people usually concentrate and move around the shades. Um, we had ambition and unfortunately this, this was achieved that this open chapel and the idea of calling it an open chapel because that was also our idea would be used by this very small community and the communities surrounding that area. And we've heard that it's being used for first communions, weddings, so it's being used to now suddenly become part of their everyday life and something that they've um, adapted adopted. Okay, the second piece is by Office Christ and Gantenbein. It's a lookout point. Again, it's a very symbolic thing uh, that you see from the distance. I could have said that in this case, that's up there. So when this picture was taken, I think that wasn't built yet, but it's interesting that from right here, you see it up there, and then the pilgrim is going to have to do all that distance. Oops. So they did this lookout point, kind of symbolic tower. Ai Weiwei, this Chinese artist and architect, did this cross, uh, and like the pilgrims are walking in this direction. They come to this axis that's facing north, east, south, and west. And it works at, from one point, you of go underground and on the other part, uh, side you find yourself lifting yourself from the ground and having finding a great view. Uh, Tatiana Bilbao with her, her second piece, like I mentioned, the first piece we did together. This is still under construction. It's in this great site. And it's this sculptural kind of sanctuary where you can uh, find a moment of rest. Uh, Luis Aldrete, an architect from Guadalajara, who did the shelters. Uh, he was like the representing the local architecture. And he did this, uh, I consider to be really fantastic structures that are resting areas that the rest of the year are used as multi-purpose rooms. Uh, we've learned that they're being used for either political conversation or even uh, dances and so on with local materials. Forgot to mention that uh, we, we kind of set a number of really simple rules because of the nature of the project. So after visiting the site, we said that we could only build with three materials uh, and that we should come up with uh, these structures uh, that should be designed with almost no dis, uh, detail whatsoever. So the three materials that we could use were either concrete, rock, or this brick, local brick. So all the structures were done in, in that palette. And for most of the cases, we did achieve to almost avoid detailing, which is a very interesting procedure in doing architecture. This is HHF from Switzerland and Elemental, Alejandro Aravena from Chile with this lookout point that's looking out in one direction to the valley and on the other side it's framing this a place called El Cerro de las Cruces that's part of like the religious phenomenon. And finally for the Ruta al Peregrino, this project that I did again with Roxana Montiel, uh, it's in this really well-preserved forest area, at least all this, this esta mancha, um, so in visiting the site, we were quite moved by how beautiful it was. And again, this um, idea of working with a very straightforward, simple, and easy to read symbol uh, was in our mind. Uh, for Roxana and I, this, this is a project that I truly enjoyed with her because we were traveling to see a site and then we would have those two hours in the plane where we could talk about the project and figure out what we wanted to do. 
And we, we both are big fans of Constantin Kadafis, the Greek poet. So uh, in these flights, we talked about that, specifically of the poet of Ithaca, and the, how it related to what we wanted to do. And in the project, of the, the, I'm sorry, the poem of Ithaca speaks of how and this is just my own words, but it speaks like how once you get to Ithaca, this promised symbolic land in everybody's mind, in this case of Ulysses, that once you get there, Ithaca has nothing to offer to you except that it gave you the trip. So we, we were very interested in how this image could work as an idea of framing the site, this site that we consider to be very valuable. And so we were very, um, interested in just creating a very simple and poetic frame to something that we considered of great value and that the idea would then be that the pilgrims had a moment to rest and realize the beauty of the site. So just very literally, and now I find myself doing the same thing, but when we were talking about this frame, we, we kept on going like that and then we said, well, it must be a circle. And we again Googled circle, which is always a fantastic exercise. And it was just incredible to see how intimate the circle is to so many cultures around the world in terms of symbolic value. Um, so there it is. It's nothing other than a circle and how this circle really interacts with the topography. And that uh, the site uh, was very interesting, and not only in terms of that it was full of very beautiful trees or a very conserved uh, uh, forest, but also that the topography was quite wild, uh, wild and it had many different uh, characteristics to it. So if you place that in that context, what you find is that you have these chances of the circle becoming something very different. Uh, in terms of how it touches the ground and then in terms of what it creates with the landscape. So again, our idea is that uh, you've been walking in that context for a very, very long time, but then once you arrive to this circle or void temple, we call it, uh, it will allow you to rest and to suddenly become aware of what you were just seeing moments ago and see it in a different way. And the pilgrim goes on, arrives to Talpa. And okay, now this is another project. It's called Margaritas. This is the pro bono project I mentioned earlier on. And it's been very important for us, first of all, because we've been very interested in trying to do this type of work for, for quite a while. And finally, we nailed it. This project is a collaboration, came through Taller de Operaciones Ambientales and the local community. And this had a process that is new for us and it's, it's really exciting because it is, has been done intimately with the people of the community. And this what you, I think, earlier on was called like um, participative uh, process. So this is the desert in San Luis Potosí. It's like you see, it's a quite fantastic landscape. And the community is what in Mexican Spanish we call ranchería. So, so it's a very small site. Um, and this is the map that shows, this was done by Taller de Operaciones Ambientales in the community, but I think they call this like a life agreement. So this is a system that plays with the different ingredients that are relevant to the, the community and then kind of evaluates what different strategies or what kind of resonance different strategies would have, where you could find the greatest impact or what should be done. And out of these tools, they decided that the first thing they needed to do was to allow a space to create identity within that community. So the first step of many steps of these group that is working directly with, with this, the, this, the people in the community, was to build a um, Centro Hidal. This uh, are the volunteers and some of the people in the community that we closely worked with. What it was, that video, it's, it's showing uh, a, a 
beautiful diagram that they came up with that was inspired in their tradition and how we kind of played around with that and, and found a way to interpret it that was relevant to them. And by relevant, I mean that it was, um, that made sense not only in functional, because that came later on, but, but symbolically and in, in emotional terms. So what it was is this central piece where people can gather and then the program kind of evolves around that in different very simple boxes considering how it behaves within the climate. And then this, to us, was very different in terms of the process, in terms of how it came to be. And one of the, the issues is that I think this is by far the project inside the office that where we've played a more, just simply a role of interpretation. You know, like in, in, in most of our projects, like I mentioned before, in, in many of them, the clients don't even, are not even sure of what they want to do. So you get involved with that process. And here people knew very well what they wanted. Uh, and they were very aware of what they needed as well. So our role in that case was very different. It was more like an interpretation or, or even a, I would say like a translation uh, uh, role which to me was very exciting, not only because it was different, but because you see the reaction of the people as immediately being very positive because you're not coming up with something that is your idea, but this is something that before it came to us had already been very digested within them. So the way it works, and this might bring me back to the idea of locality and very, feeling very comfortable with this idea, is that well, first of all, to bring materials to that site is just nearly impossible. It just, just makes it so expensive and then it wasn't going to be built. So everything here is, is, is within the site. The rocks, the adobe, the carrizo for these rooftops or for these shading areas and so on. These images that I usually hesitate to create in this case were very exciting because it was um, for the people on the site, it was, it was truly exciting to see something as realistic. You know, to us as architects, we kind of are, are used to this type of renderings, which I don't always love. But in this case, what was really fantastic was to see the reaction of the people um, to that image and what we had spoke of and what they had imagined. So the work is in progress. It's, like you saw, incredibly simple. It's, it's almost mimicking or it feels very comfortable to be very close to what is traditionally done in that site. And one of the strong reasons for this is that uh, in this case we found that there was only two or three people left within that community of a hundred people that still knew how to build this way. So one thing that we're very excited about is that now that this is being done, it is being taught to the next generation and in that way, it is being saved, or at least it's not going to get lost. Okay. And so I'm going to run a little bit quickly, quicker through this project. This is already how it's starting to look inside. And I'm jumping into another project. This is a proposal for a museum in, in Finland with Roxana Montiel as well in this really gorgeous uh, landscape, you'll see it in a moment. And uh, what was asked in the brief, this was a competition, they had this existing, I think it was 18 or early 19th century house that is already a museum, and but they wanted an extension and something of a new museum that would really take advantage of this whole peninsula, or whole uh, area. So uh, to us it was really a matter of how to uh, make a landmark in that site or how to ad adapt ourselves to such a compromising uh, landscape. And this is what we came, uh, this is our idea. We tried to design a, a very simple line that would take advantage of the whole site going from one side to the other and then making this museum as a promenade of the whole site. It works as a linear museum that on one side has the circulations and allows you to move from one space to another one without having to go into the different rooms. 
and its interaction of something that somehow goes from one side to the other, but that uh, makes sure not to become like a line that uh, suddenly is an invasion and, and, and fragments the site uh, in two. And finally, and, and maybe one of the themes that I didn't talk to as much about that, that I listed at the very beginning was clarity. And like I said, maybe that's one of the trickiest one. Uh, Alvaro Sisa, again, uh, I'm, I'm going to say it in my own words, but he says that as much as he is not interested by uh, simplicity, he is fascinated by clarity. Uh, and this is certainly an interest that we, 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 we share and that is hard to find in every project. It usually refers to integrity and how everything is, is, kind of trying, is put together. Um, but this is a project, I think, where we felt that, that at least that ingredient was very successful. So this is Guadalajara. This is a place called Parque Mirador. This is a project that's on its way. It's a contemporary art museum by Herzog and de Moron. And this is Avenida Independencia that kind of crosses the whole city and that ends in this lookout point that we were asked to design that looks out into this cañada, which is really, has a really fantastic view. So this is the strategy that we took. This is kind of like a section of the land and the cañada, and we took a piece off of it, and we placed this mensula on top of it that uh, not only creates a platform for the viewpoint that we needed and allows the cafeteria below it, but also structurally responds to this cantilever. And it looks like this. It's very simple. It has a set of bathrooms and an open space below and the platform, like I mentioned. And that's what the site looks like. The museum is somewhere up here. And that's it. Thank you.